Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming so close to Christmas. Um, so I'm Lucy, I'm a postdoc at Kyoto University, but I did my PhD here with Bernhard Mueller. Um, and yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, yeah, how we can learn about various aspects of um, binary stellar evolution with the LISA detector in a mostly uh, model independent way. So yeah, this is the, um, the outline for the talk. So it's kind of in these four broad sections. So what we can try and do is stop at the end of each of them for a few questions, um, because I think it will be nice to clarify anything if necessary. Um, so yeah, first I'm going to talk about our recently accepted work, which is about um, how we can constrain the formation frequency of binary neutron stars um, with LISA. Then I'll make a comparison between um, you know, the important properties of neutron stars compared to white dwarfs in the LISA band. Um, then I'll talk about um, you know, something that's not my work, but it is a, um, it's a method to learn about when, when white dwarfs are merging or um, stably mass transferring um, outwards with LISA detections. Um, and then I'll talk about um, some ongoing work related to um, how we can learn about tidal heating in white dwarfs um, with LISA detections as well. So yeah, let's, let's deal with um, that first question. So um, the formation frequency of binary neutron stars. So yeah, if we're thinking about um, LISA, well, you know, there's kind of a basic question of do we expect any um, double neutron stars in this millihertz band anyway because none have been detected so far with um, radio searches and so on. Um, but you know population synthesis will tell you that yes there's depending on um, your parameterizations there should be few to hundreds um, in the LISA band today um, yeah ready to be detected. Um, on the other hand um, you know without doing any modeling, uh, you can also make an estimate for how many should exist in the LISA band. So this is the, this is like the final um, expression for the number greater than a given uh, frequency. Depending on um, the Milky Way merger rate uh, for binary neutron stars. Um, anyway, you, you go through this calculation and you end up getting that there should be tens to hundreds. Um, in the LISA band. So yeah, before we talk more about that, I just want to um, introduce some uh, terminology. So yeah, this is um, stationarity and uh, binary flux. So I guess the, the key idea behind um, stationarity is that, um, you know, over our time scale of interest, so for binary neutron stars, it would be before it uh, enters the LISA band. Um, you want to be thinking about the star formation rate. Um, so the idea behind this word is that um, the star formation rate hasn't changed much in our time scale of interest, which is like at worst a mega year. Um, so what that means is if we think about these binary neutron stars as this merging population, merging from some frequency derivative um, from gravitational wave emission, you can write that the, the number density is related to that F dot and the merger rate with this simple relation. Um, and yeah, if, if they're merging from gravitational waves and ignoring the eccentricity dependence, you just get something like this. So I guess, you know, even though uh, binary neutron stars do uh, chirp, so their, their frequency does change, they do have an F dot. The idea is that the, the number distribution um, is kind of fixed in time because of the constant uh, star formation rate or merger rate, however you want to call it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's stationarity. But I guess in, in terms of the binary flux, it's kind of the, the same idea in that this, this distribution should be fixed over the past um, mega year, um, but it's that this uh, yeah, 
this merger rate is constant. Um, so, yeah. Yep, so um, back, back to the theoretical estimate for how many there should be. Um, so in, yeah, in this uh, Milky Way merger rate, um, it's pretty cool. You can actually um, calculate it in terms of the, um, the LVK co-moving merger rate, which is uncertain. Um, and then the, you know, some, some local measurement of uh, blue light luminosity, so like a proxy for star formation, also uncertain within a few factors. And then this is the, um, I guess, the cosmological, uh, I think, like a density of uh, galaxies. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to um, introduce where the merger rate that we base this kind of binary flux stuff or um, stationarity on. Okay, so. Sorry, just, mm, just, yeah, yeah. Do you prefer questions at the end or can I? Is well, it? yeah, maybe. Wait, is that? Okay, got it. Maybe 10 more minutes at the end of the section. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, okay, so let's say there's a uh, few to hundreds based on the numerical simulations or this um, estimate, they're in agreement. Um, so they should exist um, and we can detect them. Uh, but now we want to ask, you know, what exactly do we want to learn from them? Um, and specifically, um, what properties do we kind of want to um, play around with? Oh, cool. Um, yeah, but to answer that question, let's think um, about how you get a binary neutron star in the first place. Um, so these binaries have survived um, two supernova explosions without becoming unbound. Um, and even for the ones that do remain bound, because of um, the possibility of um, large supernova kicks, you can have um, quite large eccentricities induced at formation, whenever that is. So as well as supernova, there's also um, mass exchange mechanism, so um, mass transfer or common envelope at various um, stages of the star's lives um, that are also you know, very, very complicated processes. Uh, but no doubt, you know, all of these probably uh, play a role in setting, you know, the separation or equivalently the orbital frequency at which they're forming. Um, but at the moment, this is something that's completely observationally unconstrained. Um, so yeah, now, now if we think specifically about um, millihertz formation, so the binary forms in the Lisa band. Um, this has been seen in some of the uh, numerical simulations where maybe on the order of 10% form with millihertz frequencies. Um, but yeah, there's many uncertainties uh, in these calculations, so we can't know for sure yet. Um, but I think with millihertz formation, the interesting thing is that if these things are forming in the millihertz band, when they're observed by LISA, they haven't really had much of a chance to decay in their eccentricity. Um, so they'll probably be measured, at least some of them, with you know um, a few point ones in eccentricity. Okay, maybe maybe now let's stop for questions, Ilya, because this is a bit of a change of track. So, so one question was um, whether you, for the Milky Way stuff specifically, since we're focusing on it, yep. it uh, rather than looking at things like LIGO estimates, right, which are based on two observations and with varying masses, etc. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so large error bars. Whether it makes sense to look at the galactic uh, observed uh, binary pulsar uh, distribution, right? Because you have something like twenty systems there, uh, mm. uh, twenty W stars we know of in our own galaxy, right? So, yeah. so would that be? Uh, uh, would it not be more constraining both in terms of rates and in terms of birth properties? Mm, I think, yeah, maybe we can go through the calculation, but my feeling is that it would be, it would severely underestimate the binary neutron star merger rate because the, 
Yeah, I think the, the galactic population has merger times of like months up to maybe a few hours is the fastest one. And there's like 20. So then, yeah, without, without accounting for selection effects, you would think that there's none in the Lisa band. But then, yeah, I guess for people who understand um, double pulsar detection and what we're missing out on um, and what are the chances you actually detect it, you probably could, but yeah, I'm not so, yeah, that's, that's not my thing, but maybe someone, someone knows, pulsar person. Yeah, I mean, I mean there, there have been you know, 20 odd years, uh, maybe more than 30 mm. of papers uh, yeah. trying to estimate, uh, you know, because nobody trusts the, you know, LIGO is a new thing and popular mm. since models nobody trusts, and rightly so, and so uh, people have been, you know, since the, the early 90s have been uh, mm. in this game trying to estimate uh, the merger rates from the galactic population. Uh, so, you know, the estimates are actually not that different from what you have, uh, you know, they might be, mm. you know, 20, Per million years per Milky Way, which is uh, you know, worth your sort of 660 uh, uh, per cubic gigaparsec per year, corresponds to about 70 per million years per Milky Way. So within mm. you know, maybe a factor of three less, but, but not that far off. Uh, but yeah, anyway. But, but there, I think there's also some evidence there for uh, um, the at least observation. If you believe that the Milky Way is uh, representative, or actually you don't have to believe that because you are mm. specifically interested in the Milky Way. Mm. I think you would you would argue there is some evidence there for what the properties of uh, at birth are of the uh, double infrastructure, including things like their electricities, for example. Mm. So after the 20 observed pulsars, how many are going to like, merge soon? Within, the, within uh, about eight, something like that. Okay. And does it mean that you can use, that you can use only the eight that are expected to merge soon? And well, I mean, this in principle, right, is, is uh, 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 you know, sensitive starting with 10 to the minus 5 hertz, right? So now, of course, you have a lot of noise there, so you know, it's, there's no guarantee of detectability, but that means that you, you could be looking at things which have uh, orbital periods of uh, up to a day. Uh, some of those are not merging, but, but might still be relevant uh, for these sources. It's the game of the noise, because here on this spot, you don't really even have to move the minus 5. It's mm. kind of to the minus 4. Yeah. And it goes up quite fast. Mm. Just to make sure I understand, so mm -hmm. to assume stationarity, it's not that you need an equal star formation rate to merge rate, but it's the formation of mergeable BNS rate to merge rate. Right? Yeah. So um, in the observed like double neutral star population, uh, I just don't know the numbers, but like, where's the line for the mergeable and not mergeable? Maybe. Delay time for like a millihertz. So up to like a mega year, I think. So like if, yeah, if there's one like at point one ish, it would be a mega year. But yeah, so it would be like mega years to kilo years moving that way in frequency, and I think. I think the whole Taylor pulsar is like merges in like a gig year, much? one gig year, or longer. I it's much less. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely not less. It's, it's, I think it's. I can't remember the exact value, but it's. it's I think it's yeah, one to two gig years. Yeah. Two. I mean, you basically need. Okay, eccentricity can actually help you a little bit, but for a circular binary, the orbital period has to be, I think, less than eight hours for canonical uh, mass or something like that. Maybe. Maybe 10 hours, I think, could mm. be estimated. So all the, the, the ones you showed on the DNS plot is like definitely much. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we will get there now. <coughs> also, the, this plot is kind of like a kindergarten drawing. I don't expect it to actually look like this, but anyway. Um, yep, OK. So now we'll move on to how <coughs> you might actually perform this test. Um, so yeah, we've established there's probably some binary neutron stars in the Milky Way. So let's say that after a few years, there's these nine uh, detections. So yeah, each, each has a gravitational wave frequency 
and eccentricity um, assigned. So that's kind of how we're going to deal with the detections, scatter them in this uh, FE plane. Um, so before we move on, uh, one thing we can do with binary neutron stars with um, LISA detection uh, from gravitational waves is we can actually set a frequency from which every single galactic binary neutron star will be detectable. Um, so that means you don't have to worry about um, selection effects, which is useful. Um, so yeah, you can think about this as when, when is the sample you're seeing representative of the intrinsic population? Um, so we calculate this to be past um, 1.5 millihertz. We can see all of them. And that was um, what those, you know, the few to hundreds numbers were based on, by the way. Okay, so we had, we had our points and then we determined this uh, complete sample window, which you just like extend up to some arbitrarily high frequency. So the next thing you can do is consider for each point the past and future evolution of the binary because they just evolve um, from these Peters equations because they're just uh, point masses for our purposes. Um, so we know exactly where they're going to be um, or what will the new eccentricity be when you change the frequency in the future or the past. Um, but the thing that I guess is special about the neutron stars um, is that because they can be born or observed with these um, non-negligible eccentricities, um, the, the speed at which they sort of move along their flow lines can differ by, you know, an order of magnitude or so. So when you start thinking about, you know, comparing comparing the history or future of each binary to then think about, um, you know, maintaining a constant merger rate or whatever, um, it gets complicated because you have the F and E uh, coupled evolution. Um, but, you know, uh, we did introduce uh, before this idea of the constant uh, merger rate. Um, so, you know, the system is in this kind of steady state to maintain the constant merger rate. So actually, um, these have to be arranged in a particular way, given their evolution and different time scales in order to uh, maintain a constant merger rate. Um, So anyway, because of that, we seek a single variable uh, to assign uh, all of these binaries to make like, a, yeah, to directly compare with the assumption that, um, you know, they all, basically they all uh, formed at some low frequency and then they've been traveling along these lines since um, and there has been this uh, constant merger rate. So, yeah, the, the variable that we use in the end um, is just, so yeah, this is our um, band, our complete sample window uh, in grey. So it's just like you take a binary, you calculate the time that it's been in the band so far, and then you divide it by the total time that it's spent in the band. Oh, sorry, that it will spend um, in total. <coughs> um, so yeah, you assign that to every single binary. And then, yeah, if, if you consider removing, removing the points now and just assigning each F and E this tau value, so it's dimensionless time unit in the band, the contours look um, something like this. So, you know, even though we know that the more eccentric ones have, will go through the band much um, faster, um, you can still sort of, um, yeah, get them on sort of the same playing field by assigning this tau value. And then, yeah, you'll see that the, the more eccentric ones have a more like equally um, spaced tau value, whereas the zero eccentricity ones, um, they spend a really long time at the low frequencies 
and then relatively short time, you know, going through these uh, frequencies. So, and that's just from those um, Peters equations. So yeah, the, the point of that was to kind of get rid of the coupled um, eccentricity dependence with how fast these things move through, through the band to maintain a constant merger rate. Okay, um, and yeah, the, the nice thing about this uh, variable is that if all binaries did form there at low frequencies, once you assign um, the tau value, you would expect that the distribution is uniform. Um, and yeah, like I keep saying, um, that just comes from um, that steady state uh, constant uh, merger rate thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's built into the definition. So yeah, if, if all binary neutron stars form uh, you know, at 0.01 millihertz or something, then once we assign all these, we just expect a uniform distribution. But yeah, now, now we'll move on to considering the possibility of having uh, some fraction of the observed population that uh, formed in the millihertz band. So we'll just call that B. Um, so what we can do now is we can generate, oh, yep. Is there actually any other way of independently determining the age of these neutron stars? Like if there are pulsars that you can compare and therefore maybe even deduce what was the birth distribution of the eccentricity frequency. That would be very valuable. Yeah. So is there? Uh, I'm not sure, but I think that, yeah, maybe if there's like dynamically formed binary neutron stars, then the aging thing will get sure. complicated, yes. but yes. yeah, but it maybe, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure, does anyone? So, I mean, people measure spin down ages by looking at p over p dot, yes, essentially, yes. right? And uh, and you know, one game that that you can play with just the galactic population is you can actually uh, play a similar game, right? Where you say, okay, p over p dot is how old this neutron star is, or you know, two times p over p dot, whatever. Um, you can you know how long this binary has until merger, right? Is is that uniformly distributed, right? So you can play this game. The answer is no, it's not. Um, from the observations, but of course that that's uh, uh, likely a signature of some additional selection effects that this isn't considering, and also the fact that probably p over p dot is not actually a very accurate measure of the true age, because uh, uh, you know, these, this kind of argument makes some assumptions about exactly how the magnetic field is evolving over time, uh, and uh, probably our models for the magnetic field evolution aren't quite right. So, so, I mean, so, so if, you, if you want to use p over p dot as a proxy for the age, you have to make some assumptions about what, what's happening to the deck. So. But I, I think the interesting thing would be if you then can follow these trajectories uh, back in time, and then hmm. you could see how uh, you could learn, have at least some crude estimate of how some of them are, are born to which could be very interesting. Hmm. I mean, we do know from the, galact uh, the observed galactic population, but keep in mind there could be selection effects of that uh, you know, they almost all look like mildly recycled pulsars. There's you know, one millisecond pulsar in there, GX737, but the rest uh, the, uh, the, the universe look mildly recycled. But of course, keep in mind that that's, you know, if there is, for example, a significantly dynamically informed population, they might be underrepresented in the observed galactic uh, radio pulsar binary system, uh, sample because uh, the recycled, mildly recycled ones which are going to be coming from binaries are precisely the ones that are going to be observable for longer in radio, whereas the non-recycled pulsars, which you might imagine would be prevalent in yeah. a dynamic form population, um, you know, probably, yeah, but, uh, they're, they're, they're all the they're, they're not recycled, right? You don't, you don't see them as pulsars. And I'm not saying you should apply this indiscriminately, probably when you see the pulsar, you probably know it's so. Had a rough estimate is a recycled one or not? Oh, that's what I'm saying, right? But I'm saying that there's there's basically no population. Those that are young, uh, we could try that. Right. I'm just saying that there's no the dynamic form the dynamic form population. If you had one in globular clusters, you would expect these would be old, essentially dead pulsars in the sense that they would be old neutron stars that wouldn't appear as pulsars, right? So so you could imagine they're just not not struggling to see those. 
in regular service. Right? Because they're just, okay, if you have two neutral stars that are each 10 billion years old and nothing has recycled them, you wouldn't see it. As a, yep. You wouldn't see them as pulsars, so you, so you wouldn't see them in the regular population. Maybe I can have something related. So you said that you can just, you know, observe like binary neutral stars, that, 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 that they're just born with some eccentricity. Mm. Is it possible to do some kind of like backward modeling? Because if you have like a population of a tissue distribution at, at birth, mm. maybe you cannot go back and constrain, was it like isolated dynamical or like the of the cakes or something like that? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, actually, um, in this study, that's an alternative method to this like tau value. You can equivalently deal with like the, yeah, the eccentricity population that you're seeing and like, is it consistent with, um, you know, you kind of break break this up <coughs> into say like, I don't know, from this tau is 0.5 line. And then like you, you know, you ask what were their eccentricities or whatever uh, at the start of the window. And I think, yeah, you can, you can also use the eccentricity to test the exact same thing. Um, but yeah, I hope that with the dynamical formation question that they'll be able to get like localized, but I don't know. Because it, it poses a problem if you have this like suddenly eccentric, well yeah, you have a binary neutron star in a cluster that formed recently from dynamical interactions. It's like posing as a, um, a very eccentric isolated binary. So, yeah, but I guess my point is that if you if you have only dynamic formation, if you have only dynamically formed binaries, mm. they have a particular electric distribution, like thermal or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you have like isolated binary from kicks or whatever, maybe you have some some different distribution. Yeah. So you can kind of try to weigh them somehow and yeah. kind of, uh, see what you can find about. Yeah, those. but I think maybe the problem is with the with the dynamically formed ones. I think there's um, there's a study. Um, using cluster Monte Carlo that looks at this question and they find that there's like one to three or something expected in all of the um, Milky Way globular clusters. So it's like, yeah, trying to f call that a distribution might be hard to, but. Just a quick question, just a practical one. What, what is F over here? I mean, what, what, the frequency of what, right? Is this the ah. order of frequency or gravitation wave frequency? Yeah. Or how do you define for eccentric systems? Uh, it's just two two times the orbital frequency. Two times the orbital frequency, okay. Yep. Because, of course, for very eccentric binaries, at periapsis, the gravitational frequency has multiple harmonics. Yep. Uh, and, uh, in fact, uh, the gravitational frequency gets much higher, right? Mm. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, for some of the uh, uh, harmonics, especially mm. looking at things you know, over there, it's have to be 0.9, right? Yeah. So the gravitational, peak gravitational frequency, in fact, is, is much larger than... than uh, uh, two times the the orbital frequency. So um, I'm the reason I'm bringing this up is that uh, you know one thing I'm curious about is I I understand the convenience of making this cut at 1.5 mm. hertz because and you can detect everything um, in this box as mm. you said, but there may be also systems that are detectable even if they are outside of this box. Yeah, like yeah. For example, highly eccentric systems. Um, where the peak harmonics might still be in the Lisa band, mm. even though the orbital frequency is a little bit too slow. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I, I'm worried that because in reality, you know, you expect to have, you know, just a handful of systems in this box. It's very mm. hard to do statistics with them. Yeah, yeah. And by imposing this cut, you might be missing out on potentially useful information. Yeah. So I think, I mean, yeah. To be honest, I think that. Uh, I mean, if if there is like significant millihertz formation, then maybe you will have some like quite eccentric ones. But I think in reality, you would expect them to live like under under 0.2 or something, um, because you know you're going to observe them at all these frequencies. Um, but yeah, I think I in reality, in the future, when someone does this test, I think that. If you were dealing with highly eccentric ones, you would just deform. Um, you would deform this uh, boundary to include the more eccentric ones because it, it it is dependent on it. But I guess the assumption is like they probably all live here, even though sorry I've drawn them up here. Um, 
So maybe it's fine to just leave it as a box for now. But you, you will have to make it eccentricity dependent. So if you can actually go into like an analytic, analytic formula that has like the eccentricity dependence of like a binary that everybody, yeah. everybody I know can do myself by using this formula yeah. for sort of like observing the eccentric binary just mm. in the light of end. Yeah. So, so I can uh, kind of follow the reason why you expect to see everything above 1.5 and Oh, uh, so you like still pulsar or well, neutral stars that don't just well, this is a gravitation wave, so <laughs> these are not. These oh, are okay. Really so, yeah. we're talking about the wave. So, wait, I'm just more confused. So, here you're using the observed uh, with EM observed neutral star bodies. Oh, no, no, sorry. This is just like some sample population. Okay. That I'm just saying, like, say. Imagine that Lisa detects these nine oh, binaries or something. Yeah, sorry, they're, they're not related to the EM okay. known population. It's just that, yeah, the, you know, the distribution looks very similar to the other Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> um, because, I mean, as, as we said, all of, even the, you know, things like Hostelar, for example, which have a significant point six, they, they don't, by the time they get to 1.5 million, mm. they're all just sitting in the bottom, mm. uh, in the bottom uh, uh, layer of the cloth. We, we don't know of anything that would have an explicit point nine at the mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we can consider when, yeah, you have your population of few to hundreds and some fraction B uh, formed in the millihertz band. Um, so what we want to do now is, because the number is uncertain and this fraction that formed in the band is unconstrained. We want to consider like a wide range of um, parameter space uh, for when when is this uh, millihertz formation in the population detectable? Um, so this is just one how we do uh, these realizations. So in this example, we're being optimistic and saying there's 200 binaries that are greater than 1.5 millihertz, which is actually fine because in, the, in that uh, analytic estimate based on um, observed properties, in every single um, rate, there's uncertainties of like a factor of a few. So you kind of have the freedom to um, argue what you want there. Uh, and then, yeah, say the fraction that formed in the band is 29%. So this, this blue line is just the uniform distribution. And then the red line is our um, sample realization subject to 29% uh, forming in the millihertz band. Uh, and sorry, what we're seeing is the tau distribution. Um, so yeah, you can see that, um, well, yeah, if you imagine in, in that earlier plot, so rather than you know, all these binaries evolving from much lower frequencies, 29% of them like suddenly appeared at a millihertz when they um, formed. Uh, we can see that in, yeah, in the realization, you have more, uh, you have on average larger tau values is what you would observe because you had, these binaries have some history of like forming after our observing uh, window, um, but that yeah, that's how to think of it. Like, your population will look more advanced along in their tau value, is what it looks like. Um, and yeah, and then you pick your favorite um, statistical test, and then you can, you know, ask is this consistent with uniform distribution, so no in-band formation, or yeah, is this a signature of in-band formation, and you know how much kind of thing. So we did that um, for parameter space from 0 to 500 binaries in the Milky Way and then 0 to 50 percent forming in the millihertz band. And then yeah, these two lines are just two different um, statistical tests. Uh, but yeah, how to read it with this um, star is that if there are a hundred uh, 
binary neutron stars greater than 1.5 millihertz uh, in the Milky Way, then, actually no, I'll say it differently. If, if in the Milky Way we expect like 30% um, to form at millihertz frequencies, then we need at least 100 uh, binaries detected to confidently um, constrain this. And yeah, we, we present this expression for the rough boundary for when it would be uh, detectable. Um, yeah, so just to summarize that section, um, we presented this method to constrain the formation frequency of binary neutron stars in this like model independent way. Um, and the reason we were able to do this um, is because we treat double neutron stars as point masses in the Lisa band. So what, what we are like interrogating in the data is some deviation from evolution from those Peters equations alone and also assuming the, that they formed um, before our observing window. Uh, and we did this uh, by compressing the eccentricity and frequency distribution. Um, and yeah, this was like the, the key idea behind it. Um, you know, if, if this is the case that um, there was low frequency formation and they just evolved from gravitational waves only, in order to maintain the constant merger rate, your F and E, or equivalently that tau variable, um, you know, have to look a particular way. Um, so that's, that's all on this. Oh, and I can move on to white dwarfs after some questions. Sorry, is yeah. it okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, my, I guess two concerns. Mm. Uh, one concern is a purely numerical one, which is that mm. I suspect that in reality, you're going to have about 10 sources in this band. Um, because okay. Uh, the, okay, if we trust that these influence the galactic population, yeah. the suggestion seems to be that there are about 20 uh, double neutron stars that emerge in per million years. As you showed, your relatively circular ones um, have about 500,000 years uh, to go from getting mm. into a band into a merger. Your sending ones have even less, but that's when suppose they're all circular, right? So you have yep. about 500,000 years worth of binaries that are 20 merging per million years, you have only 10 in this band, right? Mm. So I think it makes it very difficult to uh, do a statistical test for uniformity. Yeah, and definitely. I'm wondering if actually your, your realistically your best bet rather than um, uh, you know doing that kind of statistical test is simply to ask for how eccentric do your sources get, right? Because mm. you, you made this point earlier, which is which I absolutely agree with, that if you form things such that the binary is formed long before uh, it gets into this band, right? So now you don't have to rely on it actually forming in this band, right? Mm. You can say, look, it can even form before this band. It can form at one millihertz, it can form at mm. 0.5 millihertz, but still, it forms long before this band. Eccentricity decays very rapidly. So by the time you get to this band, you expect things to be relatively circular, mm. right? And uh, um, so you're really looking for eccentric systems, right? You're yeah. looking for highly eccentric systems, and you can just say, are my most highly eccentric systems consistent with still coming from um, a uh, isolated binary evolution channel? Mm. Um, and my other concern is, is uh, and Mike can probably comment more on this, mm. uh, is uh, you know, how well can you actually measure the uh, eccentricities, first yeah. of all? Mm -hmm. And secondly, for the things, and maybe the second part is something that, that you're bringing up in a moment, by the time that things get very close to circular, in particular, when eccentricities are hard to measure, mm. you typically just see one harmonic and that's it. Yeah. Then you really have this concern of, can you tell apart your handful of double neutron stars from a huge sea of double white dwarfs? Mm. Right, so, so the problem is that you will see things that you know have frequencies of gravitational frequencies of two millihertz and have eccentricities that are observationally consistent with zero because it's very hard to tell apart yeah. zero from 0 0.05 mm. and they could be double neutron stars or double white dwarfs and the double white dwarfs will dominate simply because there are so many more of them. And mm. so, so I actually worry about the detectability of uh, double neutron stars at low eccentricities. At high eccentricities yeah. it's easier because you don't expect double white dwarfs to have high eccentricities. Yeah, well so, so the, the 1.5 millihertz thing is also based on yeah, when, when is the chirp mass constrained within like less than 10%? Um, 
I think. So, yeah, I think most most white dwarfs will have a chirp mass of like 0.3-ish. And then, say these are all like 1.2 or something. It should, yeah, I think if, if we pushed it to lower frequencies where you can't actually confidently measure the F dot, then that would be a huge problem. But I guess that's why we're kind of excluding it. Because, yeah, in... I don't work on like the detection side at all, um, but according to like the, the estimates, in principle, yeah, you can know the chirp mass of um, a binary neutron star system within about 10% at 1.5. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of the in terms of the eccentricity, I think it's like say your worst case scenario, it's at 1.5 millihertz. If the eccentricity is like 0.1, I think he's still... No, you get like an SNR of 1 at 20 kiloparsec, which is like a yeah, a pessimistic distance, but it is true that like if there was one there, you would be... Yeah, you'd be missing out on like a 0.1 and you'd be setting at 0, which is potentially problematic. But yeah, I think... Sorry, this is how I answered your question at the conference, but <laughs> this is like pretty much vertical. So this is point one. It's not so, yeah, maybe at the higher F it's clearer, but yeah, I think in terms of the, the frequency dependence, it's not as big a deal as it would be missing like a, a point eight where um, the curves are actually not vertical at all. Yeah, I'd still be, I mean, I actually agree with you that uh, you will tell you will be able to tell apart the the helium white dwarfs from mm. uh, uh, double stars. I mean, but but the there are because there are so many more double white dwarfs than double neutron stars. I'm worried mm, that even the yeah. high mass uh, tail of the double white dwarf population could still actually dominate or at least significantly uh, um, degrade your sample. Yeah. Well, then it, it might be a case of saying like, okay, we might we might have to omit some of the questionable ones with like a 1.1 chirp mass or something. But I think, yeah, in terms of the galactic population, I think there's two candidates, a pulsar white dwarf, and the white dwarf components must be like one solar mass, which I, I thought you could only like get from a merger anyway. So, I mean, they're candidates. I, I don't know if they're, I don't think they're confirmed as white dwarfs, but then it means you have a less massive neutron star and yeah. So I think we can like we can cut up the um, parameter space if we want, but like you say, it's going to be like slim pickings. Sorry. Uh, mm. Oh yeah, thousand years is. Um, I don't know, maybe like here. I think this is one year. Maybe. Because I thought, like, if yeah. You, if, if they're born in these, <coughs> in like a thousand to ten thousand year bands, yeah. Probably might be able to see the signal of the second vision star. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah. But if you want him to be born in the thousand to thousand year band, uh, I think you are, uh, and you want one to be, uh, uh, you know, that, that that means for Lisa to see one, right? The merger rate must be at least one per thousand years, one per ten thousand years, right? If if there's, sorry, what I'm saying is if there's, uh, if something is is born, uh, something exists within ten thousand years of merger, right? For, for something in the galaxy to exist within 10,000 years of merger, it must mean that on average, you know, must have at least one double year merger for thousand or 10,000 years. And I think that's uh, that's kind of pushing things a little bit. Now here, I agree that galactic double neutral stars are actually uh, radio measurements are completely useless because these are things where the, you would need an acceleration search. So you're actually not searching for such uh, closed binaries. But I think there, things are already sort of borderline pushing on the, um, the most optimistic LIGO event rate estimates. Mm. If you assume, if you assume that in the steady state, you know, a galaxy like ours has at least one double neutron merger every ten thousand years, uh, then uh, uh, it actually would correspond to uh, something like a thousand mergers per cubic gigaparsec per year uh, for uh, LIGO, and that's already uh, sort of at the, at the upper end of the of the LIGO event rate. 
Le mesure de l'audit au poste, l'audit de l'audit au poste, l'audit de l'audit. C'est bien. Oui, ça serait bien de faire ça. Oui, mais je ne sais pas comment la localisation sera comparé à how good it needs to be for, but whatever, be optimistic. <laughs> also, the well, second supernova is most likely that it's just actually going to be actually mm. quite a bit of Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So that was the binary neutron star section. There's just a few minutes left, so I'll maybe, yeah. Instead of going through the slides, I might just kind of flag some works and upcoming work, but I'll try to wind up at 55 for final questions. Um, yeah, okay, so we've already been talking a bit about um, white dwarf binaries, so if you had some questions about some of the numbers in the binary neutron star stuff, it'll probably be here. Um, so yeah, the, the reason we were able to do the well, construct the last test is based on like the fact that uh, the neutron stars can be treated as point masses because they're you know this big, um, but white dwarfs are typically you know this big, um, and they can also have like quite a quite a range of uh, component masses depending on the complicated um, binary stellar evolution stuff where. I don't know, white, uh, neutron stars is maybe a little bit more um, concentrated. Um, and yeah, the, the reason, uh, yeah, the reason we did that was because of the uh, point mass approximation. But the thing I want to say about uh, white dwarfs is that because the, the mass range is so big and like they're physically so big, um, is that in, in this Lisa band, say from like one millihertz or something, in principle, like the, the whole population or some, at least the lowest components can be in like a mass transferring system for pretty much the whole uh, band. So you can imagine that trying to do this like clean comparison with, um, you know, some, some deviation from that, the point mass trajectories from gravitational wave emission gets complicated. Um, but yeah, a, a benefit of white dwarfs is that there will be a lot more of them. So I think this, this number is really like, based on recent work, it could be tens of thousands or it could be hundreds of thousands. Um, so like we just have a much bigger N to deal with, which will be nice. But then there is this complication of them doing stuff pretty much in the whole band. Um, or like, I guess specifically, not evolving from gravitational wave emission alone. Um, and yeah, to put that into perspective, the merger frequencies of these white dwarfs can be like as small as a few millihertz as well. So yeah, if you think about doing the, the constant merger rate thing, you can imagine that past the, the first frequency that they can merge, like your your merger rate actually becomes frequency dependent because you know, no more 0.15 solar mass white dwarfs can merge anymore because they already merged. Um, so yeah, I, I told this joke at the conference, but it needs more explanation. So yeah, summarizing that table, um, the situation with white dwarfs compared to like the clean binary neutron star population like reminds me of someone like this person um, you know completely covered in bees um, that are just like all buzzing um, and asking you know a really complicated question about um, you know what, what are like the individual life cycles of like an adult bee when there's just like all these bees um, sitting on them so yeah this is like this is my impression of trying to do <laughs> like white dwarf science um, with the LISA detections. Um, but it, yeah, I, I'm not so pessimistic though. Um, there's going to be heaps of them, but I think there are tricks that you can use to um, kind of go back to those assumptions of uh, steady state and comparing with um, point mass evolution. Uh, so yeah, I said I'd finish now. So maybe 
Yeah, I'll, I'll be here all afternoon until five or whatever. So maybe we can chat more about this, but I just wanted to flag that, yeah, in terms of the, the, merging, the merging white dwarfs uh, and mass transfer and what that might do to your um, fluxes, this is actually being done in um, this study by my uh, supervisor. Uh, so they, yeah, they consider, okay, you can have uh, unstable and uh, stable, stably mass transferring systems leading um, respectively to like a white dwarf merger or an out spiral that just kind of will never ever merge depending on um, yeah, mass radius relation and um, mass ratio and stuff. But yeah, you should check out this study. But the point was that we can, you know, if if a flat flux corresponds to like that constant merger rate of um, the steady state, once you get to like a few millihertz, um, you have to start dealing with, um, you know, these out spiraling things and mergers so that, you know, it was flat and then it kind of drops down for various reasons and then this is when like the most compact white dwarf must merge and then you just have like no flux here because no binary white dwarfs can exist there as a binary. Um, so yeah, I'm just saying you can do stuff with white dwarfs even though they're complicated and we're currently looking at, oh, I think all the figures went missing, anyway, um, currently we're looking at um, how we can how we can take like various aspects of those um, two methods uh, and try and learn something about the prevalence of tidal heating in the white dwarf population. But um, yeah, because of because of all the things I flagged, you can imagine it's going to be complicated. But yeah, it, it's basically a matter of like you have so many binaries, so you can you can cut up parameter space, like for example, you can uh, only choose like higher uh, chirp masses to try and exclude um, the really low mass fluffy ones that are going to be merging and stuff um, to then kind of compare with that uh, point mass stuff. But yeah, anyway, sorry I ran out of time, but I'm happy to chat this afternoon about this if anyone's interested. But yeah, it's not. It's not so complicated, but it's still really complicated, <laughs> I think. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave the summary there. But thanks, thanks for coming this morning, and thanks for all the interesting questions. And yeah, if anyone has a final question, I can answer it or try. Maybe a naive question, but um, for the white dwarf mergers, you should have E and counterparts, right? So you, how much does that help you to constrain all of this? And Maybe from the present statistics on what is assumed, like a type 1 AX supernova mm. associated, can you, can you use it in any way to make some educated guesses on the number of events? Yeah, so I think, I think actually in that study they use like point, point 0.02 per year. So like 50 years they merge, but I think that's a similar thing where they yeah, base it on like cosmological type 1As or whatever, but then I guess that's another another question if um, yeah, if that's where most type 1As come from, but I think yeah I don't know, because then there's the thing of like uh, you know, in theory you can have the white dwarfs that never merge and out spiral instead, but yeah, that, that's all I know about the EM stuff, like doing, looking at cosmological stuff of whatever in other galaxies and then putting it on our galaxy again. But it's, it's not just the merger signature, right? I mean, we also have signatures of the mass transfer white dwarfs, right? We know of uh, you know, a pretty robust population of AMC EM systems, right? mm, which are yeah, yeah. Uh, mass transfer white dwarfs, right? So, yeah. And we know, for example, you know, where the you know, okay, roughly where the shortest uh, over the periods are of the observed systems. So yeah. know, presumably things from there on either rapidly plunge or spiral out, right? And the turnaround is you know, 
five minutes over the period. Yeah. Like that, right? So, uh, uh, so there's this whole population thing here between you know, in 85 minutes, which is sort of where they start mass transferring in five minutes, yeah. which is where they must have to turn around and plunge, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so presumably there, all of those are, are additionally used for these trains, right? Yeah, I think so. But I think sadly, like the, especially in the Lisa band, the AMC VN systems are like, I think the fastest one doesn't even have its like um, companion mass constrained. So it's hard to know like, and I think they, they've mentioned, they've <coughs> measured the frequency derivative and maybe the second frequency derivative, but to be negative, suggesting that it's like slowly slowing down. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't know, who knows? They're, my impression is that they're surprisingly uncertain in terms of their properties. Mm. Oh, thank you. No, no, thanks. No, it's good.